What do honeymoons, morning toilettes, observatories, and Pomeranians have in common? Naturally, another episode of Queen Charlotte. Cheerio, everyone. This is D Movie Man, fellow cinephile, popcorn addict, and emerging film critic, coming to you with reliable recaps, reviews, and reactions. And today, I'm coming to you all with another episode of Queen Charlotte, Season 1, Episode 2, Honeymoon Bliss. This episode is directed by Tom Verica and written by Shonda Rhimes. And now, let us commence. So we open up this episode with the new Queen Charlotte waking up alone after her wedding night and being introduced to her morning toilette. For those who are unfamiliar with the term, it was a significant part of fashionable society in the 18th century. The toilette was the act of getting prepared for the day, which included dressing and doing your hair and makeup. It first became a ritual during the reign of the great absolute monarch, Louis XIV. The ritual then spread to other courts in Europe and the nobility, with different levels of formality accompanying the event. So, once Charlotte is properly dressed and coiffed, she is excited and ready to get down to business. To defeat the Huns. <gasps> Sorry, different time period and country. The problem is there is nothing listed in her engagement diary as she is currently on her honeymoon. Yes, the same honeymoon that she is currently spending alone. Next, we see Princess Augusta with her team discussing the great experiment in which they give out titles and bestow favor to people who look like the new queen. There is also the matter of the marriage being consummated. None of this makes any sense to Princess Augusta. After all, there were seven, yes, seven people on her wedding night to witness the marital act between herself and George's father. It's getting weird. But now privacy is the thing. Can you imagine that? Well, as a matter of fact, she is correct. There were actual betting rituals and ceremonies that were done to demonstrate the legitimacy of the union. Now, for the most part, it would be a matter of preparation, preparing them, you know, walking them inside the bedchamber, tucking them in, so to speak, and then, you know, everyone is standing there to witness that they are, in fact, in the bedroom. You know, and we know what's about to happen, so we're going to leave now. <laughs> and we assume that the obvious consummation will happen once we leave. It's official. We know what's about to go down. It's time to leave. We want an heir. Thank you and good night. <laughs> but in the present day, they can only guess and assume that the act has taken place, which we all know hasn't. We then hit our title card, and very briefly, I just wanted to mention that although I referenced the opening title sequence and that last shot of the young Queen Charlotte transitioning into the older, mature queen, I actually didn't realize that there were two other shots where they show her walking past the mirror and then a very quick transition into another scene where she's walking up the stairs and you see the shadow of the older queen there. So I was like, oh, that wasn't the only shot. And I just, like I said, I love that detail. And also I love how it parallels the story and the way the story is being told because we're seeing the young Queen Charlotte and the older Queen Charlotte in the future. So I just thought that was the perfect little touch to show that balance between the two stories. We now see Queen Charlotte in 1815 discussing with her sons their prospects for suitable wives. This bloodline must continue regardless of their protests. But the problem is, who knows how long it's going to take for that to happen. Then, flashing back to young Charlotte, she has decided she has had enough and she is going to take it upon herself to go and visit her husband in Kew. This is also where we discover that Brimsley is engaged in a dangerous liaison, shall we say, with Reynolds, the king's secretary. Yeah, as soon as Charlotte walked off and I saw the two of them just standing there, staring ahead blankly into space, I was just like, clearly there are some unspoken feelings here. And um, considering the following scene, yeah, I was not wrong. 
We then see Charlotte make her way into a massive room with a giant telescope, AKA an observatory for observing the stars, which is also the only one of its kind in England. I thought this was another great example of some really solid production design because the telescope and just the structure of the observatory and all of that, this was not actually shot in a real location. So the fact that they built this and it just had this really cool, interesting and unique look, of course, tying into the 18th century, I just thought that was very distinctive and well-crafted. However, Charlotte is quite offended realizing that her husband prefers gazing at the stars as opposed to her company. She tries to explain to him her dilemma, being trapped in a strange place with strange food and customs and knowing no one except for him. It's a passionate plea, but unfortunately, it is all for naught. He requests that she make her way home and she does so with a fair amount of frustration. <sighs> we once again see my poor, poor Lady Danbury once again relegated to performing her marital duty with her husband. And let me also say that the actor who portrays Lord Danbury is Cyril Nri. And he looks nothing like this, you know, fairly decent looking guy. Like, so, I mean, the makeup team went above and beyond to make sure this man looked as hideous as possible. Afterwards, we see Lady Danbury washing her recent encounter off of her. And she remarks that her husband's intensity has resulted from an incident in which he was turned away from a gentleman's club named White's in Mayfair. Hmm, a lot of irony in that name. This is in lieu of the fact that he is now legally allowed entry as a member of the town. Later, we see Brimsley persuading Reynolds to persuade the king to offer some sort of gesture towards Charlotte to help bridge the gap between them. We then see Charlotte preparing to receive the gifts, along with the note from George saying that he hopes she'll never feel alone again. However, she is rather disturbed to see that George has sent her some sort of strange creature. Brimsley informs her that it's a dog, but she's confused. Dogs are big, majestic, a shepherd, a schnauzer, a dane. This is some type of deformed bunny. <laughs> What's hilarious to me about this is that quite literally last week, I was having a conversation with my mother about dogs and what type of dog I would get in the future and basically expressing that I would love to have a big dog, granted that I would have enough space for it. But I also mentioned the fact that I'm not into like the handheld dogs that you see getting carried around in purses and bags and I'm just not interested. You know, I don't despise them, but it's just not for me. I just love the idea of having a dog that is pretty hefty as far as its size and length and all that, but it's also a big old baby for the most part. I mean, they're huge, but it's just like, they will lay on you. They are just like happy to be around you. I just like, I love that. In contrast, I just don't want a dog where I have to worry that I might step on it. That's just... <laughs> That doesn't work for me, sorry. <laughs> Needless to say, Charlotte is less than impressed. However, she has more important matters to attend to, which includes meeting with her new ladies in waiting. Brimsley advises her against doing this during her honeymoon, although she may consider meeting one for the sake of discretion. She inquires about trusting Lady Danbury, and we can already see from the expression on Brimsley's face that she already has her answer. We then see Lady Danbury visiting and conversing with the queen, but things seem to be just a little bit awkward. That is until Lady Danbury asks to speak freely and Brimsley and the other attendants leave the room. Lady Danbury can see right through Charlotte's facade and she relates to her her terrible experience with her own wedding night. Ultimately, she wants Charlotte to know that it's okay if her wedding night was not perfect or desirable. However, she quickly realizes that a wedding night was not had at all, which, as I mentioned earlier, could result in dire consequences. Her position and the great experiment is now in danger. 
But then Lady Danbury also realizes that Charlotte has no clue, no idea as to what the marital act actually is. So she decides to call for Brimsley to bring some paper and charcoal. I said, no, <laughs> no. I know good and well, yeah, I was right. <laughs> the next thing we see is Lady Danbury showing Charlotte all of these graphic detailed drawings of positions. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think you get the picture, but basically she's trying to clue her in as far as how this goes, what it looks like, what she should expect, and a whole lot more. Charlotte mentions that she doesn't know how this is going to work because she doesn't even like George. Lady Danbury is like, you do know this is Britain, right? It was not that long ago that queens were beheaded for not bearing children. And I was just like, well, <laughs> I did just mention Anne Boleyn in the last recap, didn't I? But whether she has the desire or not, Charlotte cannot simply make George want to consummate the marriage. So as of now, her situation is pretty hopeless. Lady Danbury also informs Charlotte that the deformed bunny <laughs> is in fact a purebred Pomeranian. We then jump into the future once again, and we see Lady Danbury and the Queen, who are then joined by the Dowager Viscountess Violet Bridgerton. Let me also say really quickly that I have always enjoyed the Queen's headpieces and hairstyles and all of that on the Bridgerton series from day one, or I guess episode one <laughs> in this case. But I have to say they have been going all out on this series. It's like every time I see her, it's like the hair gets bigger and grander and crazier and I am just so mesmerized by whatever I see on the screen. As far as this scene, it is definitely giving me queen of hearts with the heart-shaped hair. I am absolutely loving it. The queen is seeking advice from Violet as she has multiple children of her own and she's had two weddings in two years. How can she get them to marry? For Violet, it's simple. Love makes all the difference. For the queen, this is not acceptable because her boys are in love with commoners, Catholics, actresses, and women who are already married. Even worse, their love has produced over 50 illegitimate babies for the crown. And here's my thing. I understand she has 13 children, but nine of those are sons. So you mean to tell me that nine of you all are currently populating a small country? Do you know how often and how consistently you have to... Wow. Violet then tries to kick the question over to Lady Danbury and Lady Danbury is very straightforward. She's like, look, marriage is a duty, okay? Pleasure is a non-factor. And then all of a sudden, Lady Danbury and Violet are going back and forth. We already know Violet is the idealistic one when it comes to her kids and marriage. And so she's like, it could be beautiful. It could be blissful. It could be beneficial. And then Lady Danbury is like, it could be terrible. It could be a painful lifelong sentence. But Violet also believes that in a union that does not start out with love, love can still bloom from the thorniest of gardens. And Lady Danbury agrees. As far as the queen is concerned, the flower metaphors nauseate her with their sweetness, but uh, she appreciates the effort. <laughs> like I said, the queen's dialogue will never fail to take me out <laughs> every time. But ding, 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 the queen now has a great idea. Given their advice, she could simply find them wives order them to marry, and then worry about love later once royal babies are made. She then orders Brimsley to draft a list of the most eligible brides across Europe and thanks Violet for her assistance. 
Violet is about to protest, and then Lady Danbury is like, uh uh-uh, uh, uh uh, uh uh. <laughs> so Violet just says, You're welcome, Your Majesty. Clearly, this is not what she had in mind. <laughs> Jumping back, we see that the young Lady Danbury has another royal invitation, but this time it's from none other than Princess Augusta. Lord Danbury is clearly not pleased about this as it is his family that had a relationship with the late king, so he doesn't understand what they could possibly want with his wife, as she is a nobody. And naturally, Lady Danbury has to kowtow and reassure her husband that the only reason that they would want to see her is because of his status, his reputation, and his affiliations, although that is clearly not the case. And thankfully, she's able to convince him. Oh, the joys of marriage. We then see Lady Danbury meeting with Princess Augusta, and she quickly realizes that she's being asked to inform everyone the details of her conversations with Charlotte. Lady Danbury is being very coy and evasive, and Princess Augusta is in no mood for any of it. She wants Agatha to give her the details of the tea, AKA spill some. And Agatha makes it clear that the title she's been given is Lady Danbury, Lady Agatha Danbury. And she would find it very interesting to discuss with Charlotte how shiny and new their titles are and how it conveniently happened just in time for the wedding to take place. (laughs) <laughs> Princess Augusta realizes it's time for them to speak in a womanly way, so she quickly dismisses the Earl Harcourt from the room. She makes it clear that she needs a trusted ear to know what's going on in Buckingham House, but Lady Danbury is not a fool. She makes it clear that, given her new title, she would expect income and land to go along with it. Without that, a title is simply a title. Princess Augusta has a need, and so does Lady Danbury. She takes it a step further. She says the only reason why Princess Augusta's father-in-law, the king, knew Lady Danbury's family is because her father-in-law was also a king. After all, Sierra Leone is quite rich. Money is not the issue here. The issue is with her husband and herself being denied entry to places that their positions now entitle them to. And she takes it even farther, as only Lady Danbury can do. She knows that if Princess Augusta cannot prove to Lord Bute that she has the situation in hand regarding this marriage, then the House of Lords will soon be at her door. How about that? Oh my, my, oh my, oh my, oh my. (laughs) I wasn't prepared, but I'm also not surprised. This is Lady Danbury we're talking about. Young, old, in between. She is always going to have cards left to play. She never lets me down. (laughs) Never. We then see Charlotte preparing for dinner once again, but surprise, surprise. This time, her husband is sitting at the dinner table. However, Charlotte is very aggravated that he's just suddenly shown up like everything is fine and as if all this other stuff hasn't taken place. George catches up with her and apologizes for the way he's handled everything thus far. And now, he hopes to show her where his mind has been. He brings her to the Great Observatory where he can show her what he's been studying. Charlotte then realizes, looking through the telescope, that she can see the planet Venus. He's been studying a rare occurrence in which Venus will travel in a specific arc and give them a moment where they can take measurements and know what the distance from the Earth to the Sun actually is, otherwise known as the transit of Venus. And to throw in a couple of historical facts, in 1627, Johannes Kepler became the first person to predict a transit of Venus predicting the event that would occur four years later in 1631. Additionally, the first recorded observation of a transit of Venus was made by Jeremiah Horrocks on December 4th, 1639. 
George also mentions that being born with the world revolving around him has made him somewhat selfish. Charlotte is prepared to at least start over at this point and considering the passionate kissing that soon commences, it appears that starting over is going to be a fairly simple and straightforward process. <laughs> the newlyweds then make their way to Buckingham House and to make a long story short, they do what only newlyweds can do best. <laughs> Listen, this is Bridgerton, <laughs> okay? So we know what to expect at this point. <laughs> we see Charlotte waking up the next morning, post-coital, <laughs> and looking fairly pleased. However, her joy is about to be short-lived. We see Lord and Lady Danbury arriving to their new home, which also includes lands and Eaton and plenty of cattle. Naturally, Lady Danbury has no idea how this all happened, but Lord Danbury knows that the king clearly understands his value and his worth and understands that the old days are over. Yeah, sure. Either way, it's clear that this is the beginning of a new era. We then jump back to Charlotte, who is very excited to sit down and have breakfast with her husband. That is, until she realizes that he has a visitor, aka his mother, and they are currently in the middle of a very heated discussion. Princess Augusta needs to know whether or not Charlotte has been properly bedded, and George makes it very clear that everything that he has done thus far has been for the sake of the crown. That includes charming her, keeping certain secrets away from her, and now betting her. As a consequence, he has often had to act contrary to his passions. Uh-oh, and there it is right there. The illusion has now been shattered, and Queen Charlotte makes her way to breakfast without her husband a moment that is also clearly paralleled in the future as Queen Charlotte eats alone, surrounded by Brimsley and her attendants. We also see Reynolds attending the king, who out of nowhere has had some type of physical attack. He sends for the doctor while also reassuring the king that Charlotte will never know about the king's personal affliction. But what could it be? I guess we're about to find out. And that closes out episode two, Honeymoon Bliss. Another really solid episode. Man, I, you know, I enjoy just seeing the dynamics at play here. I like seeing Queen Charlotte come into her own. I like seeing, you know, this mystery with George. You know, of course, all this nonsense with Princess Augusta and... <laughs> her crew, but especially, you know, Lady Danbury has always been my favorite. So just seeing her bond with Charlotte was something I was really excited to see. And we see it happening. We see the early stages of their connection and their relationship. And that was something I even remember was like only marginally hinted at in the first season. I was like, man, it would be really cool to see more. And then, of course, in the second season, they kind of expanded on that. And then we're seeing the entire backstory now. So just like I love just seeing that dynamic between the two of them. But yeah, it's just the, the costumes, the connections between the characters. And of course, this is not necessarily something that appeals to me specifically but I know a lot of people are going to be excited by the fact that we are getting um, plenty of skin and steamy scenes. <laughs> and, you know, skin on skin and, and all that. I get it. I get it. And I think a lot of people were irritated with the second season because that did drop off. I do think that was the result of the Ponderosa, as I always call it. You know, obviously we weren't dealing with the same dynamic as we did the first time around. And, you know... I'm sure you can recall that <laughs> with uh, the Duke of Hastings and Daphne, yeah, they were getting it in around the clock. As a matter of fact, the whole sequence we see next is like a game of Clue. First position, in the bedroom. Second position, in the library. Third position, in broad daylight on the front lawn. I was like, <laughs> there was nothing that was really pushing the envelope like that in my opinion. And then that whole episode, I was like, oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, well... Yeah, so 
yeah, this is a part of the Bridgerton brand. And ultimately, it's something that is enjoyable for a lot of people. And I'm not mad at it. You know, it's depicting intimacy. This is obviously going to be a very, you know, impactful relationship in the future. And they clearly love each other. So, you know, we get to see the beginning of it. But it's a little fractured at the moment because, you know, somebody's not telling the truth. There are things we don't know. And at this point, Charlotte kind of believes like, oh, this is some bull and I'm still stuck in a bad situation. So only time will tell how they make their way out of that. <laughs> and as always, feel free to leave your thoughts below regarding your thoughts on my recap and the episode in general. So once again, this is D Movie Man signing off. And I'll see you with the movies.